Well, good morning, church. It's good to be back with you guys again. We've made some different arrangements, and uh, we hope that uh, things will be uh, a little bit better this week. And uh, I'm missing getting together with you guys, but I praise the Lord we have the opportunity to get together uh, on uh, online. And my prayer is that we continue to stay connected, continue to be the church. Uh, I'm thankful for all those that have uh, tuned in for Sunday school on Wednesdays and uh, all the Sunday school teachers and leaders. Uh, thank you for your flexibility. Uh, let me encourage you to continue to simply to give online uh, or to mail it in or, or swing by the church office. And uh, as this stuff changes from day to day, uh, we'll continue to give you guys updates um, on how we're going to continue to function as a church. And so uh, I praise the Lord that uh, he has allowed me to be a part of new prospect during this time. And uh, I don't know of a greater time in history that the Lord is allowing the church to get the, the gospel message around the world uh, according to the internet. And so uh, today I want to encourage you to take your Bible, turn to John chapter 19. We're going to look at one verse. We're on the sixth cry. And um, as we've walked through each one of these cries, as we make our way to Easter, uh, my prayer is, is that we'll be able to get together on Easter uh, Sunday morning, whether we're in the sanctuary or we're going to do um, some other things uh, in the parking lot or continue our social distance, and we'll figure it out what we need to do, but uh, just stay tuned for that. But John chapter 19, verse 30, I'm going to ask you to stand as we read the Word of God, and uh, my prayer is, is you, as a family, uh, as you guys get around a computer or iPhone or your television, whatever the case may be, that we are able to worship together today. John chapter 19, verse 30, we're going to be looking at today the sixth cry, which is a cry of finishing. Last week was a cry of fulfillment. This week is a cry of finishing. John records this in John 19, verse 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. This is the word of God. Thank you for standing. You can uh, be seated as we continue to look at this. i got three important truths that I want to give you. And uh, I don't want to give you a grammar lesson, but uh, we need to understand that this word, to tell us that, the word it is finished, three words in the English is one word in the Greek. Um, it is important that we understand what kind of um, grammar this uh, word is written in, in the original text. It's in the perfect tense, in the passive voice, and the ind indicative mood. And so I don't want to make you a, a, a Greek theologian or a scholar, but I do need to share this with you because uh, I think it will help you understand why it's important for us to uh, understand what this word to tell us that really means. The perfect tense indicates that the uh, progress of an action has been completed and as a result is ongoing with full effect. In other words, when Jesus says it's finished, what he's saying is, the progress of an action has been completed and it's going to continue. The result is going to have a continual full effect. So therefore, what Jesus has finished doesn't have to be portrayed or, 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 or played out in the lives of individuals because he has completed all that needs to be completed. So the perfect tense gives us the completion of an ongoing full effect of an act. The passive voice, it means that the subject of the sentence is being acted upon. In other words, the subject of the the finishing and the fulfillment of all the things that's going on is continuing to be act upon, acted upon and so therefore it's in the perfect tense and the passive voice but it's in the indicative mood which indicates from the writer's perspective that it's a statement of fact and it, the occurrence of this writer's perspective is not only has it actually taken place but it has actually come to completion. This word tetelestai was uh, used at least four different ways in the modern language of the day. First of all, a servant that was sent out uh, to do a task, at the end of the day when he would come back, he would say, to tell us that, which means basically, I've completed my task. It also is a, it was used in, in the language of a soldier. When a soldier was sent out on a mission, he would come back and report to his commanding officer that the mission was complete. So on the cross, Jesus was able as a servant and a soldier to say, my mission has been completed. The second opportunity that this word was used was the high priest. And I think this is one of the greatest uh, illustrations of what happened on the cross as we've been walking through over the last few weeks of the gospel according to the book of Leviticus and all the things that Jesus accomplished. And um, the high priest would take a, a examination of the lamb 
And as we've looked at this, as we walked through this, what he would do is he'd, he'd examine the lamb, the sacrifice, and when he found that the sacrifice was without spot, without blemish, and it was acceptable before God, the high priest would say, to tell us that. And so not only would he say to tell us that when he examined the sacrifice, when he would go and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, he would use the word to tell us that. All the people were listening for that word, it is finished. So as Jesus was the perfect sacrifice on the cross after having a prayer and praise, he comes and now as a high priest, not only as the high priest, also as a sacrificial lamb, he can say without spot, without blemish, to tell us that. So not only was the servant uh, a word, not only was it a high priest word, it was also as a businessman. As a businessman would go into the um, area or the town and make business transactions, basically what he would do is if there was a bill paid, he would stamp it paid in full. And we find that in, in the book of Colossians when uh, Jesus has taken out every handwriting requirement on our behalf. So a businessman would say, paid in full. It would be what would be given on a receipt. And so as this word to tell us that means mission accomplished. It means a perfect sacrifice. It means paid in full. Um, the, the last thing is an artist. An artist would use the word to tell us that. In other words, as he was painting a picture or a sculptor was chiseling away on a rock, when he would get to the final stroke or the final um, piece of, of, of work that he would have to do, that final stroke, he would look at it and go, to tell us that. And so, as Jesus paints the pictures, Jesus gives us the last stroke on the cross of fulfilling everything that needed to be fulfilled. He says the word, to tell us that. And so, as John records, and we're going to be looking at other things that he walked through as he proves the deity of Christ, as he uses this word, to tell us that, to give us an understanding of the cry, uh, our finishing cry, I want us to understand three important truths just out of verse 30. And so today, is as, as we simply break this word down, uh, it is finished. What is Jesus saying in this one word to tell us by three words in the English, it is finished? Well, first of all, I want you to understand it's a cry of completion. Now, for the English, we say the word it is finished. So the word it, what did he complete? What is this word it? What is the word to tell us by responding to? What is the subject of it. Well, first of all, I want us to understand that the it is that Scripture is complete. Now, last week we looked at this, that uh, in verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, he says, I thirst. And so, therefore, everything in the life of Christ, all the way through not only the cross, but in his burial and his resurrection was according to Scripture. And that's one of the things that we looked at last week. And so here we know that Jesus understood that Scripture is complete. Everything that God had put into to place before he said, let there be light, was according to the Scripture. Not only does the it mean that Scripture is complete, number two is salvation is complete. The redemptive plan, the plan that was set in place before the foundation of the world. The plan where Jesus becomes the lamb slain before the foundation of the world because God knew exactly what Adam uh, was going to do and how he was going to respond. And so therefore, salvation is not a backup plan. Salvation was the original plan. And so I want to give you three important truths just about this salvation being complete and what the Word of God says. First of all, Jesus is able to say, it is finished. The word it is salvation being complete. And we find that in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, where the Bible says that Jesus is the captain of our salvation. Here's what it says. For it was fitting for him for whom all are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. And so when Jesus hangs on the cross and he says to tell us that he's not only completing scripture, he's bringing many sons to glory. He's began and completed the process of salvation. Also in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, not only does the writer of Hebrews say that he's the captain of our salvation, he also says that he's the author and the finisher of faith. He's the author and finisher of, of salvation. This is the same Greek word uh, that is used in the word captain and the word author. It means that he pioneered and did something that no one else could do. And so Hebrews 12, 2, many of you guys could probably quote this, but it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so Hebrews 12, 2 
allows us to understand that tetelestai has become a reality as Jesus is not only the captain of our salvation, but he's the author and the finisher of our faith. Acts chapter 5, uh, I believe, is, is a great title that, that this word tetelestai or the fulfilling of salvation is complete. Is This is what Acts 5, 31 says. He says, Him God has exalted to His right hand, here's what it says, to be Prince and Savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. The word Prince there is the same Greek word as Captain and Author. So as you walk through the Word of God, especially in the New Testament, you see that salvation is complete, and so therefore Jesus can, from the cross, hanging between heaven and earth, being a representative of man to God, but yet being a representative of God to man, he has able to, he's able to say, I've examined the sacrifice, for I am the sacrifice. I am the high priest. I am the artist. I am the soldier. I am the servant. I am the one who's paying sin's penalty, so therefore I can say to tell us that. And so not only when he cries a completion of Scripture, a completion of salvation, the last thing in this point I want us to understand is that suffering has been completed. In other words, all the suffering that God of the universe was going to have to endure on behalf of sin, the suffering is now complete. As Jesus was praying in the garden, not my will but your will be done, there's a transition of glory there. But also, he had been uh, asked by the mother, James and John, about who could sit at the right hand, who could sit at the left. And Jesus basically says, you don't understand what you're asking. You're going to drink the cup, but you can't basically carry out what I'm going to be able to carry out. The only person that could say it is finished is the Lord Jesus. Jesus is the only one that can say that he completed scripture. He's the only one that says that he completed salvation and that suffering is completed. And I'm so glad that the Lord suffered on our behalf. He became the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 so that you and I, even though there may be suffering and persecution, that we can know according to what Paul, uh, Paul says in Philippians 3.10 that I may know him and the fellowship of his sufferings. How do I fellowship in his sufferings? I fellowship in his sufferings because I know it is finished. And so that sacrifice is complete. So as we walk through this, I want you to understand the reason that we don't have to bring sheep and goats and pigeons and things to the, to the temple or to the church anymore is because Jesus proclaimed it is finished. And everything that God proclaims is true. Just as he said, let there be light and it happened, it happened. As Jesus would would make a remark about a miracle, it would happen. Whatever Jesus says, who is God man, he is God in the flesh, it happened. And so if Jesus says it's finished, then why do we try to fill our lives full of religion? See, most of us want to find out what we must do. The question in the book of Acts is what must we do to be saved? Every man is geared to be religious. Now, most people would say, we have to repent and believe. I believe that. I believe the gospel is a man must respond in repentance and belief. And so therefore, uh, belief and faith is us responding to what God's initiated. We don't, think of it up, we don't think it up ourselves. We don't get up in the morning and say, I'm going to walk with God today. We don't get up in the morning in and of ourselves and say, I'm going to be saved today. And so this scripture being fulfilled, the salvation being complete and suffering being complete and the sacrifice of the Lord carrying out, being able to say it is finished. So what is it being finished? The scripture. So if everything in scripture is fulfilled, then therefore we can rest and live with the life of Christ. If salvation is complete, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep it until that day. And so therefore, salvation is not based upon what I do. Salvation is based upon who Jesus is and what he's done. And so this first cry or, the, or the, this first understanding of this cry of finishing is it's a cry of completion because of it. The second point, and I want you to really listen because we're going to have to go through this, but I really want you guys to um, take note. Our notes will be on the Internet. Uh, I think it will help you guys in your own personal study. But the second cry is a cry of certainty. Jesus says it is. Okay, so not only do we need to look at the word it, and not only do we, now do we, now we need, to, need to look at the word is. Now I know, again, in the Greek it's one word, but it's three words to explain what it is in the English. So let's look at the word is. It's in the present, 
Is it not? The word is is in the present. So when Jesus says it is, from that point on, it's complete. And so therefore, I'm going to walk you through a couple of things. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying that going to the cross, <laughs> living the life, see, the, the, the birth of Christ, the incarnational birth, the life that he lived, everything that he did, the person and the work of Jesus Christ allows him to say it is finished. So I'm going to give you at least three important truths about this, uh, about this is. How is it complete? It is complete in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Number one is Jesus was obedient to the Father's work. How do I know that? Well, John constantly was dealing with the deity of Christ. In other words, that God became man and remained God. And so therefore, here's what he says in John 4 as he talks to the woman at the well and the disciples have come in and basically begin to deal with uh, do you know who you're talking to? Do you know this lady? So forth, so on. Here's what Jesus says, because they've come back out of the out of the city for the sole purpose of getting bread, and they're back making Jesus, or they're wanting to pressure Jesus into eating. Here's, here's what Jesus responds with. And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, and here's the word, and to finish his work. And so therefore, as Jesus is hanging on the cross, he's basically proclaiming to the Father, I have finished the work. John chapter 4, John chapter 5. Here's what John says again in John 5 verse 36. He says, but I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, there's the word, for the works the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. So Jesus came. He was sent for the sole purpose to be obedient to the Father's work. You find that in John 4, 34, John 5, 36, but also in John 17, verse 4. I love as Jesus is praying the high priestly prayer before he goes to the cross. I want you to hear what he says. I have glorified you on the earth. Here's what he says. This is before the cross. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. So before the cross, Jesus says, I finished it. On the cross, he proclaims, it's complete, it's finished, it's done. So that's, that's the reason last week was so important, that there was one little point that needed to be fulfilled, and that is, I thirst. So he had to complete the scripture, so therefore he had to say that and bear all the things that went on on the cross to be able to say, it is finished. And so today, I can stand before you and say that my salvation is not based upon my prayer, my preaching, my good works, my coming to church or watching it online, my good, my good, my goodness is like filthy rags according to the scripture. And so therefore it took God to satisfy God. And I'm so glad Jesus satisfied himself and says it is finished. And so um, in John 17, 4, he says, I've already completed your work on earth. Now here's here's what's awesome. Jesus didn't say, I'm done. He didn't say, I'm finished. He says, it is finished. Why? Because there's other work that Jesus is going to have to do in heaven. So what does he do? He is now our intercessor. He is now our mediator. He came and he paid sin's penalty. He came and sacrificed and completed scripture. And now he's going to ascend in just a few short days. He's going to ascend back to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father to intercede on our behalf. And so as we look at uh, these verses, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. I want us to uh, look at Hebrews 5, 8 and 9, because as this word is, or the Father's work is so important, here's what Hebrews 5, 8 and 9 says. Though he was a son, here's, here's what blows my mind, because he's God, yet he learned obedience by the, by, by the things which he suffered. Now God, knowing all things, being omniscient, the writer of Hebrews says that he learned obedience. Verse 9. And having been perfected, remember the high priest had to look, see, without spot, without blemish? He became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. There's that word author again. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. So Jesus can say is because of his life. We can say that all things have been paid for, is paid for, not were, they, they are. It is. It is a continual effect that he had in the passive indicative uh, perfect tense in the word of 
John 19, 30. And so uh, Jesus was obedient, obedient to the Father's work. Not only was he obedient to the Father's work, he was obedient to the Father's word. Now we've covered this uh, over the last at least four weeks, I know. <clears throat> Knowing that all scripture being fulfilled. That's what he says in verse 30. Okay? Verse 28 Knowing that all things were now accomplished, he cries, I thirst. That completes the last scripture that needed to be fulfilled. Verse 30 says, so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he says, it is finished. What is he saying? As he says to tell us that. Here's what I want you to understand. He's saying that all scripture has been fulfilled. John chapter 5, verse 24. Here's what the word of God says. John says in 524, Jesus says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death into life. He who hears my word. Whose word? The Lord's word. Why? Because the word became flesh. He is the word. He's not. He didn't just speak the word. He lived the word. He was the word. He is the word. And so uh, John 524 allows us to understand that it's in the Word of God. Also, John 12, 49. Listen to what John 12, 49 says. For I have not spoken on my own authority, Jesus says. In other words, he says, my, my words that I speak, I don't speak. I don't make them up. He says, but the Father who sent me gave me a command. Here's what it says. What I should say and what I should speak. So if Jesus never said anything that was contradicting to the Father, he never did anything that would be contradicted to the Father. So therefore, the words that he spoke and the work that he accomplished was all according to the Father. So when Jesus says, I and the Father are one, that statement that he made is a true statement. And so therefore, if he's the perfect lamb slain before the foundation of the world, world we can say to tell us that because he not only was he the sacrificial lamb, he's the high priest that examined his own work. And I praise the Lamb of God that he was obedient to all scripture. Look at what John 14 10 says. Here's what he says. Jesus says, Do you not know? Do, do you not believe that I am I I am in the Father and the Father in me? Here's what he says. The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me, I love this, does the works. So here's the deal. Here's what happened, and I shared with you guys a few weeks ago, what really happened on the cross of Calvary was that God the Father and God the Son had communion because the works that was being done according to the lips of Jesus was the Father working through the Son by the Holy Spirit of God who was always indwelt because God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is in the redemptive plan before He said, let there be light. And so we can bank on that everything that Jesus was to accomplish was according to God Almighty. So we can say it is finished. We can say to tell us that. Here's what's amazing. When I was in Israel, one of the things that, um, that I learned when we went to Calvary, to the place of the skull, Golgotha, is that the Jews believe that in the first temple that Solomon built, the rocks that was used for the foundation was cut from the mountain of Calvary. So not only, not only did Jesus do the work, he is our chief cornerstone of what he professes. Because of the temple, he is the temple. And so I want to walk you through just a few things of what the scripture points to the Lord Jesus because the Bible is all about him. See, one of the strongest evidence of the inspiration of the Word of God is the fact that 40 men over a period of 1,600 years were able to create a unified message leading to the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I just want to take just a few moments and kind of walk you through some of this. And again, let me encourage you to get the, the notes. In the book of Genesis, it begins with, in the beginning. That word literally means, I will place my son in the Hebrew. So the words, in the beginning, in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, in the Hebrew says, I will place my son. You find that in John 1, 
Then it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was, God, was with God, and He was God. And so therefore, John, proving the deity of Christ, basically walks through Genesis chapter 1. So let me give you uh, just a walk through. Genesis chapter 1, Jesus is the beginning. He's the Word. He's the light. He's the life. He's the creator. Genesis chapter 2, He's the tree of life. He's also the Sabbath rest. Genesis chapter 3, he's the seed of the woman. He's the sacrifice to cleanse and to clothe. He's the flaming sword that guards the way back into the Garden of Eden, back into the Garden of Rest. Skip down to chapter 7. Jesus is the ark of salvation of Noah. He is the pitch of atonement of the sealing and the securing of the ship. Chapter 28, he's Jacob's ladder, bringing heaven to man. Skip over to chapter or the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus, he's the redeemer, the Passover lamb, the blood that was sprinkled on the doorpost that you could escape the bonds of slavery. He was the manna that came down from heaven. He was the rock. He's the tabernacle. In the book of Leviticus, he is sanctification. He is the temple. He's the holy place where you meet with God. He's the altar. He's the sacrifice, the offerings, the priest, and the spotless lamb. In the book of Numbers, He's the ever-present guide. He's the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. He's the brazen serpent that was raised on a pole. In Deuteronomy, he's the teacher and the prophet coming who is greater than Moses. He is the Canaan land of rest. In Joshua, he was the conquering warrior leading to the promised land. He's the captain of the Lord's host. His, he is Joshua. That name Joshua is Yeshua, which is Jesus. And Joseph was told that he would name him Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. In Judges, he's the victory over the enemies and the broken Savior rising up to rescue you. In the book of Ruth, he is your kinsman redeemer. He's your lover and redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, he's the root of Jesse and the son of David. He's the pure-hearted shepherd king who rushed out to face the giants alone. In First and Second Kings, he's the king of kings and the lord of lords. He is the righteous ruler. In First and Second Chronicles, he's the intercessor and high priest. The one who is the restorer of the kingdom. In the book of Ezra, he's the house of worship and the faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he's the rebuilder of the walls, the walls of protection. In Esther, he's your advocate standing in the gap, risking his life to restore you to reality. In the book of Job, he is your living redeemer. In Psalms, he is the song and the reason you sing. He is the one who hears your cries. In the book of Proverbs, he is the wisdom personified, giving sense to this thing called life. In the book of Ecclesiastes, he's the purpose of life that lets you escape the badness. In the Song of Solomon, he is the lover, the bridegroom, and the rose of Sharon. In the book of Isaiah, he's the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He's the one that was wounded for transgression and bruised for iniquities. He is everything that we'll ever need. In the book of Jeremiah, he's the balm of Gilead and the spirit that writes God's laws on our hearts. In the book of Lamentation, he's the ever faithful one. He's the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he is the will and the will. He's the spirit that brings revival to dry bones and a river of life bringing healing to the nations. In the book of Daniel, he's the ancient of days. He's the fourth man in the fire with the Hebrew boys. In Hosea, he's the ever faithful husband pursuing his unfaithful bride. In Joel, he is the refuge that keeps you safe. He's the restorer of all that the locusts have eaten. In the book of Amos, he is our burden bearer. In the book of Obadiah, he's the judge of all the earth and the Lord of the kingdom. In Jonah, he's the salvation and deliverer. In Micah, he's the everlasting ruler born to us in Bethlehem. In Nahum, he's the avenger of God's elect and jealous God. In the book of Habakkuk, he's the holy one and your reason to rejoice even when your fields are empty. In Zephaniah, he's the faithful witness and great reformer. In Haggai, he is the cleansing fountain, the overcoming of the enemies. In Zechariah, he is the 30 pieces of silver and the pierced son whom every eye on the earth will one day behold as the Lord of hosts. And in Malachi, he's the son of righteousness rising with healing in his wings and the covenant messenger. Jesus Christ fulfilled every Old Testament word of God and there's many more stereotypes, there are many more Christophanies throughout all the Old Testament that Jesus is all that we would ever need. He is the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. There is none other. There is no rival. There's nobody that can ever say it is finished other than the Lord Jesus Christ because He is God in man. He is the God man. And so not only was He obedient to the Father's Word and the Father's work, we also see in John chapter 6, verse 38 through 40, he is obedient 
to the Father's will. What is the Father's will? The Father's will was that the Son come, live a perfect, sinless life, pay sin's penalty, have redemption's plan carried out, but the ultimate purpose of the Lord Jesus was always to bring honor and glory to the Father. Salvation is not man-centered. Salvation is God-centered. Everything that Jesus did was to bring honor and glory to the Father. Here's what John 6, 38-40 says. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will, but the will of Him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me. Here's the will. That of all He has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. This is the will of Him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him may have everlasting life, and I will raise Him up at the last day. We've walked through that God has given Him. God the Father has given his, Him the authority back. Jesus veiled His glory. He was in full communion with God the Father and God the Spirit. He veiled His glory, took on the flesh of man. And although He had flesh, He didn't have sinful flesh. There was nothing in him that was ever sinful. And so therefore, he come to do the sole purpose of bringing honor and glory to the Father, honor and glory to the Spirit, honor and glory to the Son, for the sole purpose of redeeming mankind. That brings honor and glory to the Father, to the Spirit, and to the Son. And so as we look at being obedient to the Father's will, there was never a time where the Son of God was out of the will of God the Father. And so therefore, they're never at... They're never at odds. And so what was really happening in the Garden of Gethsemane was there's a transition now that the purpose of Jesus coming to the earth to bring honor and glory to the Father. He says, it's finished. I've completed the work. Now God the Father is bringing glory back to the Son. And so when he says, not my will, but your will be done, what the problem is is they're not arguing, but Jesus is now receiving the glory of what he had before he came to this earth. Because the purpose was Jesus came to bring glory to the Father. Now, on the cross, he's bringing glory to himself because God the Father is reinstituting the glory of the Son back to himself. And he resurrects him in the glory of the Father. And so therefore, the Shekinah glory that was reinstituted back to the earthly body, the glorified body of Jesus, that's what really happened at Calvary. And so therefore, it's a cry of completion. But it's also a cry of of uh, understanding this word of, of the Lord. He's come to the place now of that this cry is a cry of conquering. This cry is not a cry of I'm done from the standpoint of they won. This is a cry of victory. This word to tell us that, again, if it was the high priest the high priest would say to tell us that because the blood has been placed on the mercy seat. Shekinah glory has failed. The offering has been accepted. The artist has now painted the picture and now we see it better. The soldier and the servant comes back and says, mission accomplished. So on the cross, Jesus is, is able to say, I have completed the mission. I've brought honor and glory to the Father. And now the Father is reinstituting the glory back to the Son. And when Jesus comes the next time, the Bible says that the Son is going to return in the clouds of glory of God. It's going to return in the glory of the Father, where God the Father and God the Son again comes in glory to prove that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit never have been at odds. And so therefore, this cry of conquering, he says, it is finished. It is complete. It is done. And so therefore, I want Again, I want to just reiterate to you. Notice that he did not say, I'm finished. He says, it is finished. The work on the earth is done. Again, John 17, I've completed this work on this earth. So therefore, he goes and he begins to pray for the disciples. He begins to pray for us. And he, he begins to uh, allow us to understand what it means to be in the world and not of the world. But in John 16, 33, here's what Jesus says. He says, basically, I've overcome the world's system. I've overcome the world's way of thinking. I've overcome the world's way of living. Here's what he said. These things I've spoken to you. Remember he said everything according to the Father. He never said anything that was not according to the Father. The Father gave him the word. Let him speak in the authority. These things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace because here's what he says. In the world you will have tribulation 
but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Why is he our peace? Because he's overcome the world. What does that mean? He's overcome the world's failures. He's overcome the world's fears. He's overcome everything that the world in the, which way, in the way we think. He's overcome the world's religious system. He's overcome the world's political system. He's overcome everything in which the natural lives in. The supernatural now lives in the natural. And that's the reason as a believer, he gives us his spirit so that the supernatural lives through the natural and we are to live naturally in the supernatural. It should become a process and a progression in our lives that here in this world, we can be in the world, but we're not of the world. And so therefore, Jesus has overcome the world system. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, John wrote in the gospel about the, the certainty of salvation in John, first John, in the Epistle of John, in the Epistle of John, he's writing to encourage the heart of these individuals that's in the church. Here's how John explains the world system. Here's what he says in First John chapter two, verse sixteen: For all that is in the world, here it is: it is the lust of the flesh, it is the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it is not of the Father, but it's of the world. In other words, everything that I see. Everything I desire, everything that I'm prideful in, in the natural life, is not of the Father, it's of the world. And here's what Jesus says. Tribulation you're going to have in the world, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. See, we're not the overcomer. Jesus is the overcomer, so therefore, because we're in the natural, the supernatural by the Spirit of God has to be deposited inside of us. Because here's the truth. Christianity cannot be lived by the natural man. Nobody can live the Christian life. Only Jesus can live the Christian life. Only Jesus can say it's finished. And I'm so glad that the completed work of Christ has been deposited in, inside of me by the Spirit of God. And now I live supernaturally in the natural. And I can rest in the person and the work of Jesus because he's completed all the scripture. So we can live a Tetelestai rested life. 1 John 2, he explains, Our desires, our flesh, our pride is the world system. I'm so glad Jesus is the overcomer. Listen to what it says. Not only does he have victory over the world system, Jesus has given us victory over the wants of sin. It doesn't mean that I don't sin. I do sin. And it doesn't mean that I don't desire to sin. I just don't desire it like I used to. Because the truth of the matter is my flesh will always desire, be desiring of sin. I'll never overcome the flesh until death. And so, here's what Jesus says in Romans chapter 8, verse 3. He says, or P Paul says it, talking about the crucifixion of Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verse 3, he says, For what the law could not do, in other words, the religion, for what me, what the law couldn't do with me working together with the law, sacrificing and doing the do's and not doing the don'ts, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, I love this, God did God completed it. you got to catch this. God completed it by sending his own son. Here it is. In the likeness of sinful flesh. He didn't come in sinful flesh, but in the likeness of the flesh of human beings. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. And so the reason that the incarnational birth is so important is that he took on flesh just like you and I have so that he could overcome the world. So that he could say it's finished. So that he could give the victory cry that we no longer have to live according to the world system. According to the wants of our sin. Here's what Romans 6.3 says. Paul says what God did, what the law couldn't do, the life of Christ did. Amen. Romans 6.3 says, or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ, Jesus were baptized into his death. He died to baptize us so that there's an identification. Let me reiterate this. Christianity is not you imitating Christ. Christianity is you participating with Christ in the life and the person and the work of Jesus Christ. No man can do it. No man can say to Telestai other than the Lord Jesus. And therefore he came, did what he did, put the last stroke on it, completed the mission. Then he gives us his life. That's Christianity. Christianity is not you living for God, but it's God living through you. And so as we walk through understanding that this victory cry saying it's finished now that human beings in the natural can live in the supernatural. It doesn't mean that we can walk through walls. It doesn't mean that we can do whatever we want to do. What it does mean now is that the Spirit of God now controls us so that the supernatural gets all honor and glory. 
And so 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 57, as we deal with the resurrection, here's what Paul, Paul says, but thanks be to God, here's what it says, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to explain something to you here. It's not that he gives us from the standpoint for us to deal with it how we want to. Basically what he's saying is he is our victory. Jesus comes and puts his life inside of us so the victory of Christ lives inside of us. Now, most of us don't live in victory. We don't walk in victory because we are trying to do it on our own. We won't rest and humble ourselves and submit our lives to Christ. We won't Galatians 2.20. We won't crucify the flesh. We won't identify with Christ. We keep trying to be more religious. We try to read our Bible more. We try to pray more. And I'm telling you, in the day and age in which we live right now, there are more people praying than has ever prayed in my lifetime. What they don't understand is they don't understand who they're praying to. They're just trying to pray to get out of their situation instead of understanding that it's the Lord Jesus. And prayer is more about appropriating than it is asking. And so 1 Corinthians 15, 57 deals with the resurrection. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, I love this. Listen to what Paul says. Now thanks be to God who always leads us, who always leads us in triumph in Christ. And through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. It is God leading us in triumph all the time. To the believer, we can rest in it is finished. The life of Christ has finished. The work of Christ has done it. So, as we understand that this cry of it is finished is a cry of conquering, not only is it victory over the world system, not only is it victory over the, over, over the wants of sin, third thing I want you to understand is it's the victory over the wiles of Satan. Now, I'm just going to be honest with you. I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about Satan attacking, Satan doing this. I want you to understand Satan is a defeated foe. That's right. We believe in dualism and don't know that we're believing in dualism. Satan is not as powerful as God. Is he our enemy? You're not going to write. Is he trying to, to tempt us and, and detour us? You're not going to write. But I'm, I want you to understand, greater is he who is in you than he that's in the world. Satan does not have the same authority. He does not have the same power. And there's many folks running around like Chicken Little saying the world's fallen and giving Satan all the glory. I'm telling you, part, it's coming together. God's doing what only God can do. And, and, and the Word of God is very clear on that. So let's walk through this wiles of the devil. Now I know the Apostle Paul tells us as believers we're to stand. We're to put on the full armor of God. We're to have our loins girded with truth, our feet shod with peace. We're to have the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, and the sword of the Spirit. All of those pieces is Jesus Christ. Who is truth? Jesus. Have your loins girded with truth. Who is peace? Jesus. Have your feet shod with peace. Who is your righteousness? According to 1 Corinthians 1.30. Jesus. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Put on the helmet of salvation. Who is your salvation? We've already looked at He's the captain and the author of our salvation. Put on Jesus. Who is your faith? Because the Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And so therefore, faith is not something. Faith is someone because the word of God is God. So therefore, the word is my faith, which is God. The sword of the spirit. Every piece of the articles of the armor of God is found and completed in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what Hebrews 2.14 says. Inasmuch then as the, children have, as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus himself likewise, Shared in the same. That through death, I love this, that through death he might destroy him. Y'all, did you hear that word? That he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. Verse 15. And release those who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now, I don't know about you guys. I'm not a very smart man. I'm from Alabama. But the word destroy means destroy. It means to annihilate. It means to do away with. And so here's the issue in America. What we're dealing with is we've got this mysticism running around as though Satan is, is overpowering God. I saw on Facebook the other day that we need to overwhelm heaven with our prayers. I'm telling you right now, heaven is never overwhelmed. Right. Never, never is heaven ever overwhelmed with the power of Satan or the prayer of the saints. Never. God is never, never out of control. He's always in control. He always understands what's going on. And so as we deal with the wiles of Satan, I want you to understand he has destroyed Satan through death. Is that not what it says? Look at what Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Paul says because of the death of Christ, he's now having wiped out the handwriting of requirements 
that was against us. Here's where he stacked it, paid him full. Here's where the businessman says to tell us that. Here's what it says right here. Having mopped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, because the supernatural was contrary to the natural, flesh and spirit butt heads. Flesh and spirit always war against each other. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Here's verse 15. Watch this. Having disarmed. Hebrews says that he destroyed Satan. Colossians says he disarmed Satan. He, dis he has disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle, spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Where did that take place? As he hung on the cross and he gave a victory chant of, It is finished. No longer has Satan got the power. No longer is the prince of the air the prince of the air because the prince of heaven, according to Acts chapter 5, has overcome the prince of the world. And so as we, this Easter, this Resurrection Sunday, as we're making our way, we can honestly say that Jesus Christ has overcome the world system. He's overcome the victory of wants. He's overcome the wiles of, of Satan. And so as we understand that this victory, this cry of conquering, this cry of completion, we can honestly believe that this is a cry of certainty. And so as we finish this, this cry of finishing is a cry of refreshing. Jesus says, I thirst. They touch it to his lips. There's a refreshing. Not only is there refreshing, there's a cry of restraining. It's also a cry of releasing and receiving. Because right after this cry, Jesus now releases the Spirit of God. So in the releasing, there's a receiving. So what is He receiving when He releases? He receives the glory that He veiled when He came as a baby. Now on the cross, as God the Father, God the Son has a communion, as Psalm 22 is quoted, as Psalm 69 comes to fruition, as he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. He begins with a prayer. He's going to end with a prayer. And in between the prayer and the prayer, these cries is there's a pardoning. There's a promise. There's a praise. There's a proclamation. And there's a completion of it is finished as he ends next week with another prayer. And so... Many would spell salvation today. Most people would go through this and say, well, it's based upon what I do. Most people spell salvation, do. Do. But I'm here to tell you that today, the Bible spells salvation done. D-O-N-E. Let me explain to you what I mean by this. If you don't get anything else, I want you to hear this. Most people believe salvation is due. Deal. God says in His Word, from the lips of God the, God the Son, living it out on, the, on, on this earth, hanging from the cross, it is finished, it is done, it is to tell us that, here's what done represents in the life of a believer. The believer doesn't do because the believer knows it's done. Because done is spelled do with an N-E. Here's what it means to the believer. Salvation is done, which means do Nothing else. My righteousness is not based upon who I am. My righteousness is based upon who Jesus is. And he lives inside of me. I'm so glad it's not based upon what I do. I'm so glad it's not based upon what I can accomplish. I am so, so glad that it's based upon what Jesus has done and what he's continuing to do is he makes intercession and he mediates on, on my behalf. And so every time my flesh wants to do something different. Over the last few weeks, this is what I've heard. Preacher, what are we going to do? Preacher, what are we going to do? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to understand that God's sovereign. We're going to understand that Jesus has done it. And we're going to simply live by faith. And we're going to walk according to his word. And we're going to live according to his life. It's not my life, but it's his. Paul says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. But it's Christ who lives in me. The life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself not only for me, but he gave himself to me. It is the life and the power of Christ 
that is going to get through not only these days, but every day to come. And so may we rest in the Sabbath rest of the seventh day of creation. May we rest in the land of rest, which is the life of Christ. May we rest in knowing that Jesus Christ is the one who said it is finished. So over the next few days, would you just simply text one another? Would you simply encourage one another with this one word to tell us that? Do nothing else. Why? Because the Lord's put the final stroke on the pain. The Lord Jesus, as the servant of all, has accomplished the mission. But the Lord Jesus, as the high priest on our behalf, has considered the, the sacrifice, became the sacrifice. And as the sacrifice and the work of the high priest, hanging on a cross, he had a cry of victory, a cry of conquering. He had a cry of completion. And he had a cry of certainty that it is finished. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that we can stand with an understanding that the cry of it is finished is not that you have been conquered, but Lord, you are the conqueror. Lord, you have overcome every religious activity. All authority has been given to you. Lord, I pray that as we simply live our lives in uncertain times, may we be certain of the life and the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, as you hung between heaven and earth, as you represented man to God and God to man, and you cried to tell us that, Lord Jesus, may we understand that you have completed every scripture. You've completed salvation. You've completed the sacrifice. You've completed the suffering. Now, Lord, I pray that you would allow us to understand that we must rest in who you are. Lord, anything that we try to substitute, whether it be our good works, whether it be our religious activity, is an idol. And so, Lord, I pray you'd convict us of that. I pray that you'd allow us to um, simply appropriate the life of Christ on the inside of us. And I pray you'd set us free from the fear of bondage, from the fear of Satan winning. Because, Lord, you are the one who's overcome. Lord, thank you that you are, that live inside of me, that you're greater inside of me than he that's in the world. And so, Lord, I pray. For individuals in this, in, in, in this room and listening uh, online, God, I pray that you'd allow us to understand biblical salvation is not due, but that it's done. And may we live with certainty, not only that you've paid sin's penalty, Lord, you're coming again. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd begin to draw folks near to you. Your word tells us that if we'll draw near to you, you'll draw near to us. And so, Lord, I pray that through an unorthodox way, through internet, through a CD, through a DVD, Lord, that you'd begin to draw people. God, I pray you'd save somebody today. I pray that you'd deposit your life into the life of an individual who has tried to do everything according to the church, but never according to Scripture. Lord, I pray that a deacon would trade in his title of deaconship for a relationship. Lord, may our relationship be settled in heaven. And Lord, for the believer that has believed everything that they've read on Facebook, they, begin, they have lost sight of your completed work. Lord, I pray that you would allow our fellowship to be sweet enough not to fret, not to worry, not to live in anxiety, but simply rest in you. Lord, we confess that when we're anxious, it's because we do not really, really, truly trust that heaven has been satisfied. And so, Lord, I pray that we'd simply rest in who you are. And I pray that you'd be honored and glorified in our lives on this earth as we live out according to the life of Christ. For your honor and glory, in Christ's name.